Sometimes when you feel screaming for a moment.
my, my first point was that this is a, a transaction that calls out for an explanation. Just one final document I wanted to show you, just one minute before. I just wanted to show you a document in the supplemental bundle at tab 2. Paragraph 1, the first and second defendants would work closely together 
earlier in the class in the online gaming business, in particular 666. Uh, Two, the defendant was the 50% shareholder and was the true or joint owner of the business. Three, he was the decisive or influential, was the, either decisive or influential in deciding whether to sell the business. Over the page at subparagraph six, the second defendant was so closely connected with and interested in the sale of the business and its terms that he attended the meeting at Prague in Prague on the personal phone. Over the page, um, we see the second defendant took part in those discussions, so those of this important meeting in Prague. And, those and, and it's to be inferred that the second defendant knew that the EBITDA figure uh, were persisted in his representation on the basis of the sale until the date of the uh, were false. Seven, he was so closely connected with, with the sale that according to the first defendant, no sale of the business could be made without his agreement. And eight, further the agreement, um, further after the agreement, he remained so closely concerned with the sale in terms of the agreement that according to the first defendant, any change to the earn out under the agreement would require his, that Mr. Bell's agreement. But these are all issues which are going to be explored at trial in any of them. I should tell your lordships um, that a case management conference took place in September uh, of this year and, and was ordered that disclosure on all issues, including the agency issues, will be given uh, in four weeks' time, the 11th of December. So we're going to have disclosure of all these issues. There was, at one stage, a suggestion by Mr. Bell that disclosure of the agency issue should be deferred until after this appeal. But that, no order was sought at the CMC for that effect. So we're having disclosure in four weeks' time. And so far as expert evidence is concerned, the learning friend says, well, the scope of the expert evidence will be reduced. He's wrong for two reasons. Excuse me, can you enlighten as to why expert evidence is required at all? Uh, well, on, on the valuation of the business and the, the, the EBITDA, uh, whether the recording representation as to the true value of the business, and also on the breach of warranty claim as to what the what the company was actually worth. In our case, is that it was actually worth. It. We were told that it had an EBITDA of one point six, and we say that it was worth its business. So it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes to that issue. On expert evidence, it's been agreed and ordered uh, that the three defendants will share it. Uh, and, that, and the expert will have to give, expert, give evidence in any event on the issue which goes to the court in the representation. It's true the expert will also have to cover it on the contractual basis, on breach of warranty. But there's no, there's no real saving to be had by, by not allowing us to pursue this amendment. So that was my third point, uh, which leads on to my fourth point, which is it's important to bear in mind, and I, I do know that your lordship have this point already, it's important to bear in mind what the judge did and did not decide. He decided nothing more uh, than, as he said, paragraph 24 of his judgment, he was reluctant to give a definitive ruling on the true construction of the agreement without investigating the factual matrix. He did not say, in fact, one might say, reading a judgment, he thought that, that we may struggle or something. But he decided nothing more than there is a triable issue. In other words, something which is more than fancy. I don't think there's any dispute between us, but that is, is the test. But can I just ask your lordship to look in the judgment itself? The learner just clearly set the principles out. At paragraphs 15 and 16, But I draw particular attention to paragraph 60, where the learned judge refers to the decision of Mr. Justice Lewis as he then was in Easy Airways. And he sets out the principles. And I just draw attention to Romans 6 and Romans 7. Um, at Romans 6, you'll see about four lines, five lines down. Thus, the court should hesitate about making a final decision without a trial, even where there's no obvious conflict of fact at the time of the application, where reasonable grounds exist for believing that a fuller investigation into the facts of the case would add to or alter the evidence available to a judge, trial judge, and so affect the outcome. So that's one way of looking at it. And in the course of the friend's argument, I think it was suggested um, one shouldn't work on the basis that something may come up. But in our submission, this is anything but a something may come up. 
In fact, it's the opposite, because the reason I've already explained, this, this transaction cries out for an explanation. Uh, and we do not have disclosure in any way, shape, or form of what was really going on between the defendant and Mr. Paul. So it's not a McCorberism type of case, precisely because it's an agreement which on its face has such strange features. Precisely. That it sort of cries out, as you, you put it, for explanation. And it, it's by no means unreasonable to suppose that disclosure will, or may very likely, produce well, material. Or if it doesn't, that in itself might be of some interest. Well, indeed. Uh, but as a matter of obvious inference, one would expect that. And yes. as I've already shown you from the Fans Unite, uh, we have a basis for thinking there will be disclosure. Um, but if one looks over the page in the judgment, of um, Mr. Justice Lewis in uh, uh, Romans 7, there's, on the other hand, it's not uncommon for an application on the part of the court. And we, we are in the same state to give rise to a short point of law or construction. If the court is satisfied that it has before all the evidence necessary for the proper determination of the question, the parties have had the opportunity to address it, the court should grasp the letter. Yeah. And all this, all Mr. Justice Tim did was to decide that we are uh, in, in Category 6, not Category 7. So he, does, he hasn't decided anything more than that. And I should add that Mr. Justice Tear is not only one of the most experienced commercial court judges in the commercial court, but he was the judge in three of the most significant cases on this, on this very point. He was the trial judge in Philatone, that we had come on to. He was the first instance judge in Aston, in Cambridgeshire. But that was a case where he did decide that the way the contract had been um, drafted was exhausted. Um, and he was also the judge in the case called the Humber Way, which is referred to in Philippine. And in none of those three cases uh, was he, uh, um, in Philippine, there was an appeal against his decision, which was unsuccessful. And in the other two cases, there was no appeal against uh, uh, in relation to his approach. But the point is, all Mr. Justice Peer was saying, who's not only an experienced judge, but knows this area very well, is that I'd like, if I was the trial judge, I'd like to see a bit more. And that leads me to my fifth and final preliminary point, which is that there are strong policy reasons why the court should be discouraging parties from these sorts of appeals. The, the learned judge described this um, in his, when he refused permission to appeal as tantamount very close to a case management decision. You see that in the order of reference. It's, it's in tab, it's behind tab A. It says it's clear, he said it was closely analogous to a case management decision. And with respect, um, we urge that on the court, not because uh, I'm in any way defensive of, of the, the merits of the argument, but one has to ask the question, why are we here? Well, because Lord Justice Lewis and gave permission <laughs> well, four months. I, I, I realise that that is why. Uh, but, but in my respectful situation, there are strong policy reasons why the court should be discouraging these sorts of appeals. We, we are now spending a day of valuable time uh, arguing about whether we should be allowed to argue this appeal. Uh, the claimant, the defendant, sorry, have spent over £100,000 trying to keep this amendment down just on this appeal. Uh, 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 and there is a real substance in the case management. <coughs> but these are not the sorts of issues where a judge decides that there, is, there are issues that need to be investigated. The strong policy reasons for discouraging these sorts of appeals. Would you like to? Um address the point that I asked about earlier, which is what's going to be the difference in real terms. Well, my lord, that was indeed uh, the, the last point I was going, going to make uh, uh, was to answer those two points. Uh, the first point, in terms of your, your lordship asked, what factual difference will it make? Yes, you've dealt with it. You've dealt with it. Uh, and the, the answer is, of course one could technically see in a skeleton argument there won't be an argument about age, but the factual investigation is going to be the same. Uh, and, and the um, the legal difference in terms of remedy, which we refer to this, is that it would give them a right to a breach of warranty claim. Uh, give up, sorry, give us a breach of warranty claim. As the Lord Lord Justice Arnold pointed out, it would be the difference between a tortious measure and a contractual measure. At the moment, our case is put on a conspiracy, is based on fraudulent misrepresentation. In other words, we would not have entered into the contract. Uh, and so we get our losses based on the misrepresentation not having been made. 
Whereas if we succeed on our contract, we have a claim for breach of uh, claim under the warrant. But that's that, that's the only difference. So those are preliminary but important preliminary points in my respect. Then one turns to each of the three grounds. Uh, so dealing first with the contractual claim. Um, in our respectful submission, the appeal gets off to a very unpromising start for two reasons. Uh, the first is that whilst in Malone French Skeleton Army, he correctly identifies that this is ultimately an issue of contractual construction. What Malone French, at least in his skeleton argument, makes no reference to is the, is the hurdle which needs to be met. Uh, and I'm going to show you in Philotone, but your lordship will have seen this already, but there are a number of cases. Lord Diplock in Tehran, Europe, who makes the point that there's a beneficial assumption in our favour. In other words, parties don't usually give up rights unless, unless there has to be a good reason to give up rights. Um, Lord Diplock in Gilbert Ash talked about clear and unambiguous language. And in Philatona itself, uh, Mr. Justice Tier proceeded on the basis that the contract has to be unequivocally and exhaustively defining the part. And, and Lord Justice Simon also talked about the paragraph 101. He talked about the heavy burden. This so, brings us back to the point you started with about the importance of it being a disposed case. It, 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 exactly. Um, and I just. Um, on this point, in terms of just the, the, the headline point, I, I do also refer, refer to what Lord Justice Mayer said when he talked about the heavy burden of persuasion. And he said that whilst it's theoretically possible, um, it's um, to exclude, to disclose it. It's not surprising the parties, this is Lord Justice Mayer said, it's not surprising that the parties were not able to cite a single case where it's been held. The words of the contract are sufficiently clear to exclude the rights of the disclosed principle. So paragraph 123 says, if the counterparty did not agree to contract, contract with the principle, he would say so. And so it's an unpromising start because whilst ultimately it's a question of construction, it's a construction against a backdrop of a very heavy burden. So that's the first point. And the second reason that it gets off to an unpromising start. <coughs> is that philatonia in our submission is the complete answer. Um, philatonia was decided the judgment of the Court of Appeal. I should say that Mr. Justice Tier, when he gave judgment in our case, had already given judgment in philatonia, but the appeal had not yet been uh, handed uh, I don't know whether it had been heard, but it hadn't been handed down. But it, the decision hadn't been handed down. Um, the decision was then handed down, I think in January or February of 2020. Uh, and, and, and it's not dealt with head on by my friends in their appeal skeleton. They don't deal with the fact that Philatone is a complete answer. And the reason I say it's a complete answer is because the very approach which Mr. Justice Tier in this case said he was he thought was the appropriate one. A two-stage approach of ask yourself why this was there an agency and why wasn't the principal there. That was his approach in this case. And in Philatona that was his approach at trial. And his judgment or his approach was expressly upheld by two other commercial court judges, Lord Justice Simon and Lord Justice Mayer, uh, with whom Lord Justice Lewis had also agreed. And so, your lordships have the answer to what the correct approach is. We've had a rerun of this already in Philatona. Can I just say this before I'm going to show you some passages in Philatona? But one could easily um, imagine a situation if Philatona had been decided by way of an amendment application uh, uh, on a learned friend's approach. Very easy to see how, uh, the, how it would have been held that the agent, that the principal could not, be, could not rely on. But that was not the judge's approach. Can I just show you, your lordships, one or two key passages? I say key passages. I should say it is. I do 
do find it difficult to, and I'm not going to, to refer your lordships to particular passages, because in my respectful submission, this entire case is relevant and helpful. And as it were, there are rich pickings for me in this case, so it, nothing, nothing much is going to be gained by me reading out passages. Um, you'll see that we've, we've underscored uh, on the right-hand side in the usual way, the passages we rely on. I found it difficult uh, to decide which bits not to underscore, because the case is so closely analogous. I mean, in practice, you're asking us to read the whole of it, which, I, is, I which is not a... A well, reasonable request, bearing in mind it's only a 25, 26 page. So. Exactly, and, 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 and I realise that your lordship will be, and so me highlighting particular points is not going to be any great. Well, I think you can take it, but we, if we haven't, to the extent we haven't already read it, we will, we will do so. Yes. We don't need to read out no, the passages at length from it. But if you have some absolutely key points you'd like to highlight, for us, by all means, do so. I'm grateful. So I will just. I think I've been able to show you your, your, some key passages, but without prejudice to all the others. But if one starts at paragraph 38, I'm afraid I don't have the page on this. I'll give you what You can see that although in the present, in the present case the judge found that Mr. Chernikin was a disclosed and identified principle, and although the parties were not able to identify any case in which a disclosed principle had been excluded from suing or being sued on the contract. It was common ground in terms of the contract and surrounding circumstances, I stress and the surrounding circumstances, might demonstrate an intent to express your way in the case of excluding the disclosed parties from the contract. Over the page, um, this is in the judgment of the Lord Justice Simon, he draws three points. The first is the paragraph 44. There's a possibility of inserting an express clause into a contract so as to exclude the possibility of an intention by an undisclosed party. Paragraph 45, second, there may be contracts in which a party is identified by a material description which applies to that. And 46, third, in the opinion of the editors of Bowsford, although the contractual terms and the surrounding circumstances may lead to the conclusion that the principle of intention is excluded, this will not occur often. The next few pages are very important because they highlight some of the authorities I, was, I mentioned in passing uh, about the heavy burden. Uh, but then the key passage, one of the key passages, is paragraph 53. Because this was, this was the very same judge um, as uh, the judge of Weirdy. It says, in the present case, the relevant inquiry involved two questions. First, why was Mr. Chernigan not named as a party? Secondly, in light of this, is the, is the SHA to be construed as excluding it from the contract? This was the judgment of Frank. And, and, and the upshot of this judgment is that approach was, was endorsed. Uh, and the judge uh, the judge's conclusion was also endorsed, namely that Mr. Chernigan was able to rely on the contract. Now, I just wanted to draw attention to one or two points. Um, I think Lord Justice, uh, Lord, Lord Justice Peter Jackson asked me what, what are the differences. And obviously one could compare and contrast the differences in the contractual provisions. Um, but in my submission, a number of the points that were being advanced by the appellants in this case are very similar to the points that are being advanced by the friend in this case. Um, save that in one respect, the appellants in Philatona had a much better point, which is not a, a, a type of point which is advanced by my learning frame. And I'll show you that. But I'll just go through very quickly. But you can see at paragraph 84, there's an entire agreement clause, which is in possibly even stronger language than in our case. But if you want to have a page, paragraph 84, um, it says it's the complete and exhaustive agreement of the words in Philatona. For what it's worth, in our case, the entire agreement says full and in time, rather than complete and exhaustive. Um, but on the entire agreement, one might say that's a little stronger. Now, at paragraph 85, the Court of Appeal refers to Kaifa, which is the case where Lord Justice Green was 
mentioned the evidential myths. And the evidential myths is the very same phrase that Mr. Justice Tier used in our case, the evidential myths. But it, as is, as is clear, Kaifa was an undisclosed person. But nevertheless, and this is important, if one looks at paragraph 87, Lord Justice Simon says, the observation, that's the observation of Lord Justice Green, is made in the context of whether there might be an undisclosed person. In such a case, an entire agreement was part of, was, was part of the evidence. It could tend to negative a willingness to contract with a person not enabled to part it. It might not be so unequivocal. And then it says this, the judge, that's, Lord, that's Mr. Justice Tier in Philotona, followed this approach. So in other words, even in a case of a disclosed agent, the learned judge in Philotona still adopted the evidential mix approach. And that's approved by the Court of Appeal. And one sees that paragraph 310 of the, of Mr. Justice Tier's judgment, if one just looks four lines from the bottom of paragraph 310, um, he says, it is evidence that can go into the mix. That is, the whole of the extrinsic evidence, which must be considered on the question whether a party is willing to contract with a person not named on the contract. So in other words, Mr. Justice Tier, in Philotona, in a disclosed agency case, adopted the same approach uh, that Lord Justice Green had put in Haifa on an undisclosed agency case. And the court well, Philotona is an appeal from a trial yes, it is. judgment. Exactly. Yes, and, and that indeed is my point. Yes, I, I, I was reminded of this by the fact that there are 300 plus paragraphs to the judgment. And, and, and your, your Lordship will be pleased to say that we spared in the bundle, we spared your Lordship that judgment. I, I should just mention in the preceding um, in the preceding chat, yes. we have included the relevant few pages from Mr. Justice Tears' approach in Philotone. So that is in, your Lordship should have that. We spared the, your Lordship's the burden and his paper. I mean, in a sense, anything that's said in Philotone is said in the context of the trial having taken place. Exactly. Exactly, but 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 the point is suggesting that there's any changes the analysis, but I mean, it's well, an illustration of something that happened in the case with these sorts of facts, and the court of appeal goes out of its way to say the judge's approach was correct, and the point that I seek to make is that that's the very same approach in our case. The judge, the learned judge, said this is the, effectively this is the approach I would take if I was the trial judge, and as it were, this is a dress rehearsal. In one might say for the term, and we can see that that's the right way to do it. And that's why it's such an important case. Um, just one or two very brief points on for the term. Um, as I say, all, all of it is relevant, but one of the really interesting parts of the, uh, of the case is starts at paragraph 95. It, it, it's in reference to what's called clause 10.1 in the supplemental agreement. And as Lord Justice Simon said at paragraph 96, without any disservice to Mr. Fenwick's other arguments, it's fair to describe his reliance on the supplemental agreement as his strongest point. And if I can summarise the, the point here, is there was a supplemental agreement which made it clear that a transfer of rights um, from Miss Danalina to Mr. Chernobyl was not regarded as a change of control for the purposes of clause 10.1 agreement. And as Lord Justice Simon says in the middle of paragraph 96, if he, that's Mr. Chernikin, were a party to it, Mr. Danalina would have nothing to transfer to him. It demonstrated that he was not the real and only principal, or the only person who had the rights and obligations under the contract. So in other words, if you have a supplemental agreement which says transferring to Mr. Chernikin is not a change of control, that makes no sense if Mr. Chernikin was already a party that had rights under the agreement. And the learned judge below and the court of appeal were not persuaded even on those facts that it was sufficient to rule out um, Mr. Chernikin as a party. And it just draws attention to one point. Um, we haven't supplied the authorities, but I do draw attention to the test again, paragraph 96. The your lordship has it says it's the real and only principle or the only person. And he refers there to a case, um, uh, first of all, to Lord Sumner uh, in Drogheda. But he also refers to Ferry Wells, an associated British 
court. That's the humble way. And that was a judge. That was another authority where Mr. Justice Tier was, was, was the trial judge in the humble way. So finally, on on Philosophy, the, the key paragraphs, the conclusion are key. Um, you're just assigning the paragraph 100 to 101 makes it clear, you can see at four lines from the bottom of 101, like the judge, I'm satisfied there's nothing in the background or the contractual term sufficient to demonstrate a clear intent to exclude him. And, and, and as I say, one could easily imagine if this had been argued on a summary that a different conclusion would be reached. The, the other passage which I just brought to your attention, in particular, it, it is the judgment of Lord Justice Mayles, uh, gives a very short uh, concurring judgment. But he then makes the point at 1 2 2, 3 to 1 2 5. Uh, if a counterparty wants to exclude a disclosed principle, one would say so. And Lord Justice Mayles was not surprised that there was no case which had been cited where this had ever happened. So, you can see that Lord Justice Lewis, of course, gave permission to appeal in this case. Um, it gave it. it Gave a concurring. So that's the legal position. Um, and in short, we invite your lawyer, if you're able to leave the point, to follow the judge's approach on the contractual construction. The clause, none of the clauses are sufficiently clear, bearing in mind the heavy burden. Uh, none of these clauses are sufficiently clear that this court or the court below could be satisfied. That this case can be determined on a summary basis. Uh, and I've already made reference to that. Well, in front of you, I think it's the greatest weight on 50 years. Well, um, we, accept, we, we agree with, with, with the learned judge, which is whereby he said, after a factual investigation, one could well imagine, it is at least argued, uh, that Mr. Bell was not a third party. And in my respect, the submission, uh, it's not difficult to imagine a judge reaching that conclusion. Because to describe Mr. Bell in the circumstances of this transaction as effectively a third party is a very odd proposition. It's in a boilerplate form. And it, I can make this submission because it has the endorsement of Lord Justice Simon, although I would otherwise do it with some hesitation. It, it's never very fruitful to say, well, how a could a clause have been drafted. But Lord Justice Simon said in this sort of case, actually, there's some force to the point. If you wanted to exclude, as my Lord Lord Justice Peter Jackson said, he could have excluded by saying, Mr. Bell, sorry, Mr. Mark, enters into this agreement as a principal owner. He gives a warranty that he, that, he, that he assumes full and complete responsibility for all obligations. And it's, as I say, it's easy to say, well, how could it have been done? But given the high hurdle that needed, needed to be that's what the parties could have said, and they don't say it. Nor do they say in the recitals that Mr. Martin is, is entering into this agreement only as a principal. In fact, we say no. My submission at trial, if I'm allowed to make this point at trial, that is likely to be nothing short of that will be sufficient uh, to exclude him. Obviously, bearing in mind all the, once we've heard all the evidence of why this happened. Um, now, I don't know whether any particular, one, one clause I I should deal with the restricted public. Um, we, don't, we don't say that Mr. Bell is bound. Um, on a proper construction of this agreement, it cannot be the case that he was bound by the restricted public without, uh, without him being expressed as a party to the agreement. Or at least, we don't need to apply that case, and we don't apply it. And the learned friend says, well, how do you not do it? <coughs> How, how do you do that? As if, as if, as if there's some difficulty. But our, our answer to that is on a proper construction of the agreement, uh, those, that particular cover should probably be construed as an obligation only against Mr. Martin. The Lynn friend says, well, how it, it finds Mr. Martin um, in the recitals and it gives his name and address. It does. It doesn't say what capacity, does it? 
doesn't say acting only as a principle. So we say that for the purpose of the, of the warranty, at least the warranty, uh, which is what we're relying on, he, they represent he is a party to those warranties. And the fact that uh, he's not, uh, that on its proper construction, um, he's not bound by the restricted covenant. We say, I didn't need to say much more than that to see for the trial judge to decide. But, but it would be unsafe for this court to say that because there are some restrictive covenants against this in this scenario, that provides the clear and unequivocal uh, answer that, that, that we're looking for under the contract. How does one distinguish the parts of the contract which are, um, so to speak, opened up once you bring in Mr. Um, that was the part of the part of the problem is the, the, the only distinction is the issue of covenant, which are obviously personal. I see. So you're saying really the entirety of the contract, apart from the restricted covenants. I can't say to my lord that I think for every clause to be checked, okay. because, because all I do rely on are the, are the financial warranties. Yes. Um, so what, but what I can say is, is yes, the distinction, to answer directly your lordship's question, uh, if there are things which are peculiar and personal only to Mr. Mr. Mark, like the restricted covenant, for exactly the reason we are referring to, then on its proper construction, Mr. Taylor is not bound. But in all other respects, um, he can't have his case. He will be committed. He can't have his case. So if he wanted the money, uh, and he wanted to sell his share, he's liable for the warranty. That's what I think. I can deal, I think, very briefly with um, contractual estoppel. Contractual stop. It would be, in my respectful submission, a surprising result if, 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 if the contract itself, the terms are not sufficient, uh, but there was nevertheless a contractual stop uh, to prevent us from getting started. But I, I accept that's a matter of the trial. But I, do, I need to do nothing more, I do do nothing more, to rely on what the learned judge said, which is for the same reasons that the contract needs to be construed against the background of these. Extraordinary facts, and so does the contractual estoppel. And I add to that, the contractual estoppel does not say, one may say this is surprising, it is not entered into on the basis that Mr. Martin enters into this contract, which is exactly what you would expect if the, if the, if the, if the recitals had the effect intended for by the friend. This is quintessential, just like the contractual construction, uh, it's quintessentially a matter of the trial. Court. Once we've been up here and down here, we're looking into what's going on. That, 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 is, that is my response on contractual stock. Uh, so far as the election point, the Lord Justice may have picked up, but Lord Justice Lewis and I have um, thought that was, this was a, a, a not such a strong point, but he was not minded to exclude it, given that yes. the other points were going, were going, to, going, to, um, going on appeal in any event. Um, there are two arguments. Well, there are two points in there. Um, the first is it can't be equivocal. Sorry. It can't be unequivocal where Mr. Martin was both a principal himself and an agent. And that's the very point of the judgment. If we were in a binary situation, principal and agent, I could see how the argument might get off the ground. But in a case where he is a principal, he owes and he's selling his share, it cannot be said conclusively that it, that it is um, an unequivocal statement. The other point is that we don't accept the premise of the argument, because we say there is a, a, a legal issue that needs to be properly and fully argued at trial as to whether issue and proceeding is enough give rise to uh, an estoppel at all. And I've referred in my skeleton to, which I don't think I need to take the to too, but uh, the editors of Bowser make it clear that there is no, they think that all of the cases can be, can be decided on the basis of an estoppel. In other words, someone has acted to the detriment. Whereas here, all we have is issuing proceeding. Now, this point was raised very late in the day before the learned judge. Here for the very first time in the room of the Senate. But 
for the hearing. So, although it wasn't, I didn't appear below, it, 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 it was a new point. And one does not see in the judgment any full argument. But what Mr. Justice Tier did, he did acknowledge that, um, in his judgment that there is an argument about what the issue is perceiving. Obviously, it's different in, in, in a way which is familiar with other cases where judgment has been obtained. But this was merely the set of issues and proceedings. And if, if I could just remind your lordship of what Mr. Justice Tier said at paragraph 27, he made the point over the page of the 60s. As has been observed by the editors of Bowsford and Agency, there are a few cases where the defence has succeeded and where it has, and where it has the success is explicable on grounds of stopping. Now, it's fair to say he doesn't decide the case on this basis, but he doesn't, he doesn't say either way. He says there's a complete answer because there needs to be a factual investigation. And this goes to the point about the learned friend exception. The issuing of proceedings is only a prima facie, even on his own case, a prima facie, as, um, as my Lord Justice Arnold pointed out. It's not for the court to speculate. Um, and so there is a, he decided, effectively, on a factual basis. But we have always made it clear we don't accept the legal basis of the point. And your lordship, if your lordships are against me on this, it would mean deciding that difficult legal point on the basis of, uh, I say this about my own submissions, as well, and not about my own friend, on some rather flimsy submission and as, to what, uh, as to whether there is actually a, a legal point here. Why do you describe it as a legal point? Why is it not a factual point? I mean, election is a general proposition, is a question of fact. We've got, we've got the House of Lords and Lords and Lords of Lords. Yes, but, but, the, but the question is whether election is whether actually it is a properly characterised or as an estoppel. That's what the editors of Bowser, the, the point you made, made in Bowser, is that that fact is not sufficient to the, the case. So I'll show you, Lord Chief, just what, what the editors say, say. They say the cases need to be decided on the basis of an estoppel. In other words, reliance on the act, as opposed to a purely, purely as an act. I accept an election. What, what, do you, sorry, I may have misunderstood your argument. Is it going to be your argument at trial on this issue that you can never be debarred by election? Because at the moment, the only basis upon which I think that I can see that argument being put is upon the basis that this came up in the course of argument in the Taylor and Weiler case, namely that the liability of the SCA to the principle is not alternative to the joint and so forth. Yeah. And, and the doctrine of merger, which, mm. which is what, what causes the, the, the case to, it, what prevents the, the party from pursuing the principle. Right. So, so, in other words, the reason why you say that this is a legal issue is you say either there's a stop or there's merger or there's nothing else. Because, because once you've excluded the first two categories, the only possible basis that's left, which election inverted commas, can't actually arise because, in truth, once you've excluded the first two possibilities, what you're left with is joint and several liability. Nothing further from us at this stage. Thank you very much, Mr. Yes. May I reply briefly to my learned friend's excellent submissions? On, on the last point on estoppel, while it's fresh in my mind, my lords, um, there are two points I want, I want to make. First, as a matter of fact, we're not simply relying on the issuing of proceedings. We're also relying on the obtaining of a freezing order 
and putting in witness evidence and affidavit evidence in support of the position that Mr. Martin was the sole party to the contract. Second point is, and it's a very short point, my learned friend relies on Bowstead to say that there isn't really any election. It's all either a stopple or, as my Lord Lord Justice suggested, merger, but the doctrine of uh, election doesn't exist at all. That isn't for this court to decide with great respect. This court should has two court of appeal authorities that I've put before it dealing with election, which of course binds this court. And if my learned friend is right, he's got to take that point in the Supreme Court, not here. Um, uh, Bowstead, um, which your lordships haven't been shown, is wrong. Turning back to the start of my learned friend's submissions before lunch, my learned friend addressed your lordship on the point of clause 15.12 and suggested some terms of uh, construction. And I think he adopted a proposition from my Lord Lord Justice Arnold that it was intended to address Third Party Rights Act. And that point was advanced and then abandoned by counsel for Ivy below when, after it had been taken in the skeleton argument below, we put the act before the court and gave it to Ivy. And uh, having read it properly, they abandoned it because the Act only provides for rights, not liabilities, unlike Clause 15.12. My Lords, if I could ask your Lordship to, um, in order to answer the question, what is the purpose and meaning of Clause 15.12, turn again to the authorities bundle and the Playboy case at tab 5. Uh, I beg your pardon, um, tab 13. And if it's possible at the same time to have open doors 15-12 which is behind tab 14 in bundle 1. At page 176. And Lord Sumption in Playboy, at page 236, 237, paragraph 12 of that case, quotes and relies upon the Siu Yin Quan case, and at 5, holds the terms of the contract may expressly or by implication exclude the principal's right to sue and his liability to be sued. And turning to clause 15.12, what that does is exclude other than the parties, anyone's or any third party's rights uh, to be sued or uh, ability to sue. So when asking the question, what does this clause do? It does precisely what is identified by the Privy Council in Sue and approved by the Supreme Court in Playboy, namely absolutely and conclusively and exhaustively excludes the rights, excludes the rights of a third party or a non-capital P party to the contract to enter into the agreement and removes the possibility of suing them. My learned friend Mr Levy says of this clause that it's both odd and a boilerplate clause, which with great respect is a difficult uh, two horses that can't be ridden at the same time. But whether it's odd or not, and whether it's a boilerplate clause or not, doesn't matter. The question for this court is what does it mean approaching it on the proper uh, basis of construction? The meaning is absolutely clear. The superfluity of the words, to the extent that they are superfluous, shows that the draftsman is trying to make clear that what he is doing is excluding the rights other than the capital P parties to be able to sue. Now, until my learned friend's final submission on the 
non-compete clause, I understood it to be common ground that Mr. Bell was not a capital P party. But I understand that's not the position now. I understand the position is that he sometimes is a party, sometimes is a shareholder, and sometimes isn't, depending on what clause uh, we are reading. That's wrong. The only proper meaning and construction of the definition of shareholder in the recital is that it applies to Mr. Martin. Party with a capital P is defined as applying to only the shareholder of the company in uh, Ivy as the claimant, and everyone other than a capital P party is excluded under 1512. Well, I have a friend suggested when he was talking about Philatona that there might be other clauses which could be put into this contract as well. When I read Philatona, I understood Lord Justice Simon to be um, not particularly impressed with the submission about other ways to exclude liability under the contract. Um, but in any event, it says what it says. There might be many ways in which liability can be excluded. That's true. But here we have express exclusion. And we, in my submission, um, it, they are better than the ways in which were suggested in Philatona. In Philatona, one of the ways suggested to exclude uh, non-party liability was to have a warranty that there, that there are no parties other than the parties to the agreement that, that um, can be sued. But if that's wrong, all that happens is that the person giving the warranty can be sued on it, and the non-party can still enter it. That couldn't happen with 1512. If I can ask your Lordship just one final point on this. Uh, my learned friend referred to the judgment in which Mr. Justice Tier cited the ICI case, um, but uh, that paragraph isn't, and he cited the ICI case, which is in the authorities bundle, if I can ask you to go to it, uh, behind tab 8. Page 114 of the bundle, paragraphs 12 and 13 uh, appear, and the paragraph that my learned friend read out was effectively paragraph 12. But if I can ask your lordships also to read paragraph 13. It goes on, in cases where the issue is one of construction, I'm pausing for a moment, this is such a case, we say, the respondent, that's the respondent to application um, to strike out a summary judgment, and in this case, the respondent should be seen as Ivy, and it's actually the applicant to amend, which is even a fortiori. The respondent often seeks to persuade the court that the case should go to trial by arguing in due course, evidence may be called that would shed a different light on the document in question. That's the contract. In my view, however, any such submission should be approached with a degree of caution. It's the responsibility of the respondent to an application of this kind to place before the court in the form of a witness statement, whatever evidence he thinks is necessary to support his case, where it said the circumstances in which the document came to be written are relevant to its construction, particularly if they're said to point to a construction which is not that which the document would naturally bear. Here we are precisely in that situation. The respondent must provide sufficient evidence of those circumstances to enable the court to see that if the relevant facts are established at trial, they may have a bearing on the outcome. We know, of course, Ivy did nothing of the sort, foreswore the possibility of providing witness statements, and didn't suggest any evidence or matrix of fact that was relevant. So even now, when your lordships are construing clause 15.12, even after my learned friend's submissions, there is not a single word as to what possible evidence there could be that could ever change the clear and obvious meaning of clause 15.12 from what I suggest it means to something different. Even if it's right that Mr. Bell wanted to stay in the shadows, whatever that means, that doesn't matter because clause 15.12 is a complete answer to the question. So much for that clause. Some further smaller points, if I may. On the status of the reply, my lords, 
Um, before Mr. Justice is here, uh, the, both parties had the opportunity to put in evidence. My client had put in evidence saying we are relying on the contract. We're relying in particular on clause 15.12, and <coughs> Mr. Uh, and Ivy didn't put in any evidence in response. <coughs> so it's not that clause 15.12 reared its head for the first time in our, in our defence, and so the reply was the only place that this could uh, this uh, this point could be taken. It could and should have been taken in evidence before Mr. Justice Tier. Secondly, Mr. Levy says that um, it would be wrong to decide a case like this if you as a court know that there might well be evidence that could uh, influence a decision but the, which hasn't been relied upon. But that is true for every Ladd and Marshall case where fresh evidence is sought to be relied on in the Court of Appeal. And there's the one question which uh, Mr. Levy didn't answer is why on earth these points weren't made before the judge. Um, thirdly, um, my learned friend says it's just a pleading point. It might just be a pleading point that uh, perhaps we should have put the points I make in the reply in a yet re-amended particulars of claim. That is a pleading point. It properly should have been in an amended particulars claim, not a reply. But that's not the point we're making here. The point is, it should have been in evidence before the judge. Now, my lords, just before lunch, wetting our appetites perhaps, there was a conversation about whether or not my clients can have their cake and eat it. Um, let me address the points that my learned friend made on that. Um, if everyone, if Mr. Martin and Ivy and Mr. Bell all proceeded on the basis that Mr. Martin was the 100% beneficial owner of all Mr. Bell's shares. Mr. Bell would be stopped from arguing to the contrary. That is entirely consistent with the position that is set out in the recitals to the contract. Now, that position doesn't require Mr. Bell to be a party to the agreement, and it doesn't require him to be capable of suing or being sued on the warranties, simply uh, that he agreed that Mr. Martin could deal with his shares as if he was the 100% beneficial owner. So that it's perfectly possible that Mr. Bell could have transferred his share ownership on that basis. And we say, Mr. Bell says, he's not bound by warranties. Other, other than that shareholding point I just made, Mr. Bell says he's not bound by warranties that he didn't give himself uh, and was never asked to give. Now, on, on the warranties point, the the point about warranties, which Mr. Justice Tear accepted, is that they are not representations, that they are contractual promises. And the party giving a warranty assumes contractual responsibility for that um, warranty and nothing more. And if the warranty is untrue, uh, there's a claim for breach of contract. So if the warranty that Mr. Martin was not the 100% legal and beneficial owner of the shares is untrue, he can be sued on that, and Ivy is protected. May I deal very briefly with a, a point that came up from the learned friend's um, submission about the fans unite letter. Um, you, you were taken to uh, the letter at tab two of the supplemental bundle. I've got yes. six very short points about this letter. Firstly, in terms of the evidence, for what it's worth, Mr. Bell says he can't recall ever having seen it, and he didn't sign and return it. And if, if you need a note for that, it's Ms. Ferris's witness statement, supplemental bundle 13, para 38, page 216. Secondly, it was discovered 
in late May 2019 by Ivy, that's their evidence. That is after the SPA was entered into. Mr. Kennell gives that evidence at his paragraph 45. So the claimant was unaware of it before the sale. So it is impermissible to use the Fans Unite letter as a tool for construction of the SPA. Thirdly, it was apparently drafted not by the parties to the SPA, but by another potential purchaser, so someone you've heard nothing about and from whom there is no evidence. Fourthly, we say it's entirely irrelevant. It simply demonstrates at some level, at its highest, that my client and Mr. Hogg were prepared, perhaps, to be parties to an agreement. And in other contexts, the SPA, he was not. It says nothing more than that. Fifthly, of course, the claimant, Ivy, entered the SPA knowing the true factual position that Mr. Bell was a 50% beneficial owner and chose not to contract with him, unlike the position in the Fans Unite letter. And sixthly, there is nothing in the Fans Unite letter which is inconsistent with Mr. Bell's case. So we say that is simply an irrelevant point. Aren't those all the sort of matters that the trial would... My Lord, I... Aren't those all the sort of matters that the trial would actually determine? On questions of construction, no, my Lord. It's inadmissible. So it's simply not possible to look at that letter to determine what the SPA means and what 1512 in particular means. It doesn't throw any light on it. My learned friend, after lunch, made a couple of points. He said that the case is going to trial anyway. All my submissions about case management are bad and that it's just... There will be cost savings. They're all wrong. And that this is just a case management decision. With great respect, the question before this court is a legal question that has to be determined. It's either right or wrong, as per ICR. And if we're right, it should be determined now. There's no reason not to. As Lord Justice Lewison observed when he gave permission, this is more than a mere case management decision. It's a decision that the amended claim has a real prospect of success. That's tab 13, page 151. And of course, as my learned friend mentioned in passing, Lord Justice Lewison was one of the judges on the court in Philotona. Philotona was determined in... or judgment handed down in February of 2020 and permission was given shortly after in May 2020. So one might well think that Lord Justice Lewison was a very well-informed judge to determine this sort of point. My learned friend has made lots of submissions about how experienced Mr Justice Thierry is. I don't disagree with any of that. But so is Lord Justice Lewison. And all the points about the timing of Philotona do not assist because actually that was well in Lord Justice Lewison's mind, one would presume. On Philotona, two very short points. We say our case is much stronger than Philotona because of Clause 1512. That is a clause which completely excludes liability. And secondly, my learned friend drew your attention to the judgment of Lord Justice Mayes at Paragraph 124, page 97 of the case. No need to go to it. But he says that Mr Deripaska always regarded Mr Chernikin as the real party to the contract. And we know that's not the case here because Ivy commenced proceedings on the basis that Mr Martin was the real party to the contract. So there is a fundamental difference between Philotona, both in fact and in the terms of the contract. Lastly, let me deal with the point that emerged late in the day that 
about the restrictive covenant. This is a point we had made this argument before Mr. Justice Tear in the skeleton argument and submission to Mr. Justice Tear. It's in our skeleton argument before this court. And the point that my learned friend made in submissions has only appeared just now, that actually it's accepted that clause 9.6 is a personal clause binding only Mr. Martin. And that Mr. Bell is not bound by it. Now, the submission I made to this court in support of that was only in respect of the non-compete provision. What I said was the justification for the non-compete provision was the protection of confidential information which depended on the personal knowledge by Mr. Martin of the confidential information that was being protected by a broader non-compete clause because confidentiality clauses are very difficult to enforce. That is not true of the other clauses in 9.6. The non-interference with customer relations or the non-solicitation of employees, they don't depend at all on specific confidential information known to Mr. Bell. It depends upon analogous considerations, which is to say the personal relationship to the individual and, on the one hand, the third-party businesses, and, on the other hand, the employees. It may or may not do. But the classic way of justifying... How else do you justify such restrictive covenants? A restrictive covenant is only enforceable to the extent it protects a legitimate business interest. And, classically, those are confidential information, trade relations, and stability of the workforce. Absolutely. Indeed. And only the first of those deals with confidential information. The second, 9.6 little 2, is about supplier relationships, and 9.6 little 3 is about stability of the workforce. Only 9.6 little 1 can be justified on the basis of protecting confidential information. And so if... Yes, to be sure, but we seem to be slightly at cross-purposes. Absolutely. I have no difficulty at the moment in accepting the proposition that only little Roman 1 is justified by confidential information, and little Roman 2 and little Roman 3 are justified by the other types of considerations. However, the point which is common to all three is that they're personal. And I understood that was the point you made in opening, and that's the point I understand that you need to accept. Yes. There's no difference in that regard between 1, 2, and 3, is there? Well, I... My Lord, I accept that. The big point I make about this is that it makes no sense for capital S shareholder to mean two different things in the same... Indeed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Levy, there might have been a mention of one or two cases that weren't mentioned in opening. Do you wish to come back on another? No. No, I can confirm that with you. Thank you very much. Well, in that case, that concludes the argument. Thank you both very much indeed, and those behind you for the helpful written and oral arguments that we've received. We will reserve our judgments and follow the usual procedure, which I'm sure you're well aware of, which is to let you have them in draft, inviting corrections of typos and obvious errors with no re-argument. And we hope you will be able to agree an order between yourselves, if not brief submissions in writing on points of disagreement, which we will deal with on paper. And hand down, for near certainty, will be in the 